welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. Kay Marie and Ali Moreno here with you in the studio. A little later on, we'll be checking in on the latest from the Women's Euros, where the 2017 defending champions Netherlands were in action today. But we will start with the news of Kalidou Koulibaly's future. He's said to be close to signing for Chelsea in what's expected to be a 40 million euro signing for five years. Chelsea obviously looking to strengthen the defence after losing Rudiger and Christensen to La Liga clubs this summer. To talk more about this, let's welcome in Julian Laurent and Alessandro Del Piero. And I'd like to start with you, Ale, Alessandro, because I know obviously that you've been keeping a close eye on a player like Kalidou Koulibaly in the Serie A. Many are talking about the fact that he's 31 years old, as if this is a problem. Do you think it's a good move for Chelsea? Oh, absolutely, yes. It's a great move. I don't believe that uh, the age of uh, Koulibaly is, uh, is a problem. Not uh, today, not in two years, not even in three years. He's, uh, he's a great guy, he's a great professional, and uh, he's incre physically he's incredible. So I have no worry about that. It's a great move for Chelsea. Jules, you agree with this, I think, because you were quite firm about this on Twitter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic signing for me. It's, it's top, top three uh, best centre-backs in the world with Ruben Diaz and Virgil van Dijk right now. There's no discussion even. He's better than Rudiger Christensen put together for me. Yes, he's 31, but that's only 18 months older than, than Rudiger. And they were ready to offer Rudiger the same contract. So age is not a problem. Like, like Ali said, he's a, he's a great professional. He looks after himself. He's, he's rarely injured. He's got a great personality, great leadership on top of all the, the attributes and the qualities he has as, as, as a footballer, of course, on the ball, physically, the pace, the experience, the intelligence, everything. For me, he's a, he's a world-class player and it's a really, really good deal for Chelsea. Jules, we've put you to task today. We've made you put together a Chelsea 11 for the coming season, a possible Chelsea 11, just taking a look at it there. Uh, we do see Koulibaly, Thiago Silva and Aspilicueta potentially in the back line there. Thiago Silva, 37 years old, Koulibaly, 31 years old. Any problems for you there with this veteran pairing? Uh, no, no, because of the roles that they will play, Koulibaly will be the guy marking up, whereas Thiago Silva will be more of the guy who will distribute play out of the back and will be sort of the, the presence and the leadership in that back line, organizing everything in front of him. If you're Chelsea and you have Thiago Silva matched up 1v1 against somebody with speed over distance or taken into wide areas, then that's a problem. But the position that he'll be playing, he'll be sitting back, having Koulibaly and Aspilicueta, whoever may play on the right-hand side, marking up, matching up, and Thiago Silva is simply organizing and clearing everything up that perhaps gets beyond Koulibaly or gets beyond the other centre back. But Jules is still looking to bring in some other players, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. It would be hard to put that 11 together because Aspilicueta is very likely going to leave the club and then there will be more signings. Nathan Ake, I think, is potentially the next one. The talks are quite advanced with Manchester City for his arrival. And then there's President Kimpembe. The two clubs, PSG and Chelsea, are starting talking. He wants a new challenge. I think PSG are very happy to let him go especially if Chelsea meet the valuation of the player, which is, again, kind of a similar amount to, to Koulibaly. He's younger, but he's certainly not as good and not as experienced as, as, as Koulibaly. So that's why the, the price should be quite, quite similar. Uh, and Chelsea really are really keen on Kimpembe. Tuchel is a big, big fan of his. They worked obviously well together at PSG. He knows Thiago Silva really well. Again, they speak the same language. So there's, again, a lot of box ticked by the arrival of President Kimpembe. So, of course, if those players arrive, we would change that starting 11. Uh, but defensively, Chelsea needed at least two centre-backs and it looks like they can get three very, very quickly now. Just some of the names we're seeing there, Ali Moreno, and the names that could be coming in. Sterling we already see in that possible 11. Is this a better Chelsea this season with these cast of characters well, than last season? As definitive and powerful as Jules was with his uh, message on Twitter earlier today saying that Koulibaly was better than Rudiger and Christensen put together. Let's, let's go down that path. So that means this is an upgrade from what Chelsea had in those positions. 
I also think that Sterling is an upgrade from what they've had in that position as well. And both of these players, both Koulibaly and Sterling, I think are moving at the right time and a necessary time in their careers. Where, uh, where I think that Sterling didn't quite have the role for Manchester City over the last couple of seasons that he would have wanted, now there's a fresh start and a new opportunity. And similarly, Koulibaly, in that he has been one of the better center backs around the world for the last three or four years, and we have expected a move from him over that period of time, and it hasn't happened. And really, for the last season, season and a half, he's been good, but not great. I think this move puts Koulibaly once again in a stage in which he's going to push himself to be the best version of himself. And that will be the guy who would be better than Rudiger and Christensen. That's a guy that I'm counting on, and obviously that's a guy that Chelsea are counting on as well. Uh, this has all got a chain reaction, which is, allows us to link it to Juventus, and we'd like to do so because we've got Del Piero oh, with oh, us. Oh, how convenient. Now, the word was, Alessandro, that Kaladu Koulibaly had been identified by Juventus if Matthijs de Ligt were to move on. Now that we see that Kaladu Koulibaly is likely going to Chelsea, should they be looking to keep hold of de Ligt and not letting him go anywhere? Absolutely, yes, from my point of view, because... Uh, as Julian say, Koulibaly now is, a, for many reasons, you know, including experience, one of the best defenders that we have in the world. Uh, uh, on the other side, this guy, Matthias uh, the lead is potentially one of the best as well because he has everything. He's still very young, but in, with a lot of games on his leg, you know, in terms of international games and experiences. So. Uh, as a, as a Juve fan as well, I, I will uh, not let him go. Jules, what do you think? Are they likely to be able to keep hold of him at Juve? Of course they are. If they want him to stay, he, he will stay. If they refuse to sell him, uh, it's, it's a bit more difficult when you know that the player wants to go. And that's, that's clearly the case. I think he's got his eyes set on Bayern Munich now and working with them and, and Julian Nagelsmann. Uh, so it's a bit of a tricky situation I think for Juventus in the sense that yeah you can keep him and he might not be too happy by it, about it at the beginning and then he will get around the idea of staying one more season at least at Juventus or you sell him and you cash in now but you need again the, the right replacement for someone like De Ligt who Ali is right is, is one of the most promising and already a top 10 centre back in the world so if you miss out on Koulibaly could you go and get a Kipembe who we said Chelsea are, are in discussion with PSG now. Is Kimpembe really a good enough replacement for De Ligt? I don't think so, personally. So there's not many players who you'll be able to bring in now at Juve who are good enough for De Ligt. So it would be very tricky. I think this is where you hope that they've done a lot of work before in case that De Ligt would go and that they've got a short list of centre-backs where Koulibaly maybe is in and Kimpembe maybe in, but maybe also others. They like Pau Torres, for example, but it looks like they're not ready to pay as much as Villarreal won for Pau Torres. So, again, they would have to make a decision. If you let him go, no problem, but then make sure that the replacement is good enough, the right quality, and that you're happy with the price that you're going to pay for him. Uh, let's see if uh, Alessandro is happy with what we're about to bring up now. Because oh. while we're talking about Juventus, Pogba back in the 10 there, mm. this is a very heavy number when it comes mm. to Juventus. A certain Alessandro Del Piero used to wear it himself. No pressure, hey, Alessandro. Well, no pressure uh, at all. I <laughs> know uh, it's a it's a it's a good decision from my point of view. By the way, Paul Pogba has the number, you know, the the year that before he left, he left from Manchester United. So it's uh, now he presents himself in a different way. He he said a few things very interesting, you know, uh, that he understand is a different guy that uh, the one that uh, left Juve some years ago, so in a good way. So I believe you know, as a talent, as a quality player, as a personality, of course, he can wear that number for sure. And I wish him the best of luck. And uh, on the other side, I really hope uh, this is a great choice for, for Juve uh, because he, he say one thing that for me is very important. I made this, this decision with my heart. And when you move in that way, with that purpose, uh, it's, it's the best move that you can make.
Uh, let's see how good a move it can be this season for Juventus. We've put together a possible 11 for them going forward, the old lady this season. Obviously, Di Maria coming in as well. Alessandro, is this a team that can win the Scudetto this season? Well, without injuries, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, because also last year was a bit tricky for you, you know, with uh, this problem of uh, many, many injuries that they had in a different position. So, uh, but yeah, the, first, the three in the front are amazing. And the midfielder with Popa definitely is a big, big, big improvement for you there. We are just taking a look there. All right, while we are talking about Juventus, we're going to keep on because there's too many Juventus topics right now. We're okay. kind of linking it here. There's been a lot of talk this week, Alessandro, about Antonio Conte and the way he's been training <laughs> his Spurs players in the preseason and those tough training sessions that we've been seeing. 42 lengths of the pitch in South Korea in the preseason <laughs> on the third session of the day. Was it like that when you played under him? <sighs> I'm, I'm, you were talking, I, I was sweating, okay? <laughs> I, I, I already saw these images. It's not, not this situation many, many years ago. And I, and I was one of those guys. I mean, you work hard with Antonio. There's no, there's no other ways. Uh, he worked very hard. He's a, he's a tough guy in that, in that uh, physical and conditional training. He has uh, his ideas with his team, and, uh, and this is part of the training. I had the same experience in Philadelphia in a, in a preseason with him, and was, I don't know how many degrees was that time, you know, 110. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, late July in Philadelphia. You know, maybe better than me. What does it mean? Uh, and we had this uh, incredible, and I don't want to say incredible, uh, pick a, a bad word about this kind of work, uh, as you Horrifying. wish. And, uh, exactly. So that, that's, that, that's the way. Uh, and you, you build, of course, condition in, in some way, in the way that you believe, like, like Conte believe. But you also bring some mental strength because, you know, you put yourself really at the edge of your possibility. And this is uh, another, another good point from my point of view uh, uh, when, you, when you are in the preseason and you work all together and you die all together. And this is what you're supposed to supposed to happen later when the real games comes so this is the mentality so it's not a bad thing that's what I'm sensing from you how did it make you feel about him when you were getting put through the paces like this listen for us it's not a bad thing we are sitting here enjoying all the AC for, for the guys that were running is, uh... <laughs> what are we talking these these people <laughs> Did you just say 42, 42 sprints across the field? Yeah. Up and back? Forwards and backwards. Oh, mommy! Uh, look, Apparently whatever. Harry, Harry Kane was not doing well with it. Okay, whatever happened to the, uh, the fitness trainer that has the access to the uh, workload and are you on the red zone or the green zone and all that? Is, that? is that not something that we pay attention to during preseason with Antonio Conte? Because I have to imagine, third day of preseason, you're doing this back and forth. The red zone was across the board. Everybody was in the red zone. But the point is here is a bigger one for Antonio Conte. It's not whether you can do the fitness work is that you can do the fitness work and everybody's pushing each other to finish the fitness work because he's assuming that this is going to translate into togetherness <coughs> when it matters. When everybody's crumbling, when there is a lot of pressure and there are a lot of excuses that you can hang on to, you're hoping that this foundation that you're laying right now is the thing that the players hang on to in those tough moments. Oh, so you talk about that, what it can do. What do you think, Jules? Will this give them the competitive edge that they need for the new season and ensure that it's a top four finish for them? Well, this is the idea very much. I think Ali, Ali knows the, the, the fitness coach that Conte has with him. is Giampiero Ventrone, who's, who's very famous and legendary because he was in the 90s, the fitness coach at Juve. And there's so many stories that Zinedine Zidane would say how, how sick he was after every training in preseason. 
because that's what Ventrone does. He makes you work. His, his surname is the, the Marine because he's got this, he's a very old school fitness coach where you do a lot of running in preseason. The thing for this first squad though, which is really interesting is when Conte arrived and, and took over Nuno, there was obviously no time for, for preseason because there were games every three days pretty much and they had to play a lot. And even because there was no winter break, they had to, they had to keep going. So the players didn't know uh, Ventrone's sort of uh, schedule, if you want, or program for them. It's only now that they discovered it in Bangkok, in Vietnam, where, in Thailand, sorry, when it's, obviously the humidity is, is really high as well. So I think they will be very happy once they know that precision is over. And for them, which is the whole idea, the games will feel easy because they're gonna, they would have worked so hard. And again, Ali worked with Ventrone in preseason. So you work so hard that games, 90 minutes of football, of running, feel so much easier than all those that running that Ventrone makes you do. I, I, Ale, I have to ask you then, t this fitness coach, tell us more. Well, I went to Tottenham, you know, past years and to see, and they were already starting doing this kind of work. A little bit, a little bit. Like, like Julian say, you know, they didn't know what's going to happen in the summer, in the preseason, these big boys. <laughs> so, they didn't know how lucky they were. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, either Conte is going to be fired after three weeks, or uh, because everybody died on the field, or on the other side, they're going to build something really, really tough and really good for the rest of the season. And about Ventrone, yeah, I spent, you know, many years with him, and, and, uh, and he changed a lot in, about uh, how he wanted to train on the beginning of his career, you know, when I was... You know, we're talking about 20, 25 years ago, we were doing a lot of strength as well with a lot of weight, weight. Uh, and now it's changed more in the runway, uh, so more run instead of weights. But either way, you're going you're gonna to really push yourself at the edge of your possibility. And even more, maybe you don't know that you have so much energy sometimes and so much strain or so much you know, health in your body that you want to do more. Uh, it's you, you need to try. It's very tough to describe what's what's happening, but <laughs> images are really <laughs> emblematic from my point of view. You know. Uh, are you, now, are you seeing the enjoyment in Alessandro's face that somebody else is going yeah. through this? <laughs> yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, yeah, you guys go ahead and run. This is fun from here. Yeah. I, I think what's what's really key is something that Alessandro alluded to there is that the fact that you're breaking through your own threshold, that you don't quite know what your best is, how much can you give, and these guys are pushing you through that threshold and say, we think you can give us more. Man, that's tough to go through as a player, and that is painful. Alessandro knows that very well. And it's nice to sit back and watch it. If yes, you would like to sit absolutely. back and watch it, Players training and getting put through their paces. Make yes, sure to relax on your sofa. <laughs> Sit back like Alessandro Del Piero is and head on over to our YouTube page, ESPN FC. While you're there with your feet up, subscribe. Cristiano Ronaldo's future remains up in the air as we take a look at his stats over the last few seasons. Last season alone, Manchester United's top scorer, but we are hearing that PSG are the latest club to turn him down. Del Piero still with us. Mark Ogden now joins us as well, but I want to start with you, Alessandro. Can you believe that this is what it's come to, that we're hearing that there are clubs that are just not interested in Cristiano Ronaldo right now? No, I can't believe. I can't believe. I mean, I still, I still believe that you know he's an amazing champion, uh, great mentality. Yes, I, I also think that you know he's not in shape like what you used to see uh, in the last two or three years. Something is missing sometimes. But also we need to consider the fact that if you're playing a team that is performing super well, your performance is going to be much better than what you see. Uh, uh, on the other side, if you play in a team that is not going well, it's, you know, it's the opposite. So you're going to see uh, playing much worse than, than what you're supposed to, to play. So Man, C Man United is still in a very difficult position from my point of view in the past years because, you know, they have a, 
they have changed a lot. Managers, players, uh, something is missing in that club uh, after that Ferguson left. And uh, they have different problems, not only Cristiano Ronaldo. New Manchester United coach Eric Ten Hag has been asked about the situation, about Cristiano Ronaldo. It seems to have been the topic on everyone's lips right now. And he said, Cristiano Ronaldo is not for sale. He is in our plans. You wonder, though, Mark Ogden, if his wish to leave and the fact that he's absent at the moment from the pre-season tour is overshadowing things at Manchester United. It's not a great way for Ten Hag to start things at the club, is it? No, it's not. You know, Ronaldo will be a distraction whether he plays or doesn't play. That's just the nature of the beast. It's Cristiano Ronaldo. He's the, him and Messi, the most famous players in the world. So if he's not playing, then United have to deal with that and address it. You know, the one thing that we haven't heard throughout this whole saga is Ronaldo saying, I don't want to leave. You know, so he could have killed this one straight away, but he hasn't done. So we have to accept that he wants to go. You know, I've been told he wants to go and that, that United, I've also been told that if a club outside the Premier League comes in, they'll let him go. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of noise at the minute about what people are going to do, what they're not going to do. But behind the scenes, things are, you know, happening. But I think the reality is, I think, why, why has he not found a club? Well, it's not about his ability. And I think we, we had this similar discussion with Neymar over the week, and even to a lesser extent, someone like, you know, Paolo Dybala. There's a lot of players out there right now that would do a very good job for a club, but they cost too much money in terms of wages. And Ronaldo is, is at the top end of that. He's on over half a million pounds a week at United. And nobody, not even PSG, is going to pay that kind of money. Now, Ronaldo might even take a pay cut. But again, is he going to take it to the point where he becomes affordable for a club to take what would be a gamble? Because you put Ronaldo into your dressing room. And as we've seen at United, it causes disharmony in the sense that he's a big star. He gets all the attention. And the team ultimately plays for him. And he'll probably get a lot more money as well. So if you take him Ronaldo on, you have to be prepared for the, the negativity that comes with it. Yes, he'll score goals. He'll still score goals. But as we saw with United last season, when he does score goals, it can often be to the detriment of the team itself. United won nothing last season. And let's not forget, when United played at Man City, at Anfield, at Chelsea, he didn't play because Cristiano Ronaldo at 37, nearly 38, can't have an impact against the biggest team. So if you're being offered the chance to take him on, you have to question whether it's actually worth it. Just picking up on what Mark said there about what it can be like to have him inside the dressing room. What happens if he does stay at Manchester United inside that dressing room? Is that going to continue to be a problem, Ale? Well, everybody better grow up. And if you're a player, Manchester United, and over the last couple of weeks, this has been leaked out, or at least that has been the information put out there, that there was a division in the locker room because Cristiano Ronaldo was too demanding. Now, I have to tell you, that sounds like players who are very soft, that Cristiano Ronaldo is demanding something out of them and these guys are saying, don't be so mean to us, Cristiano, don't be so mean. I, can't, I cannot play under these circumstances. The truth is, is that if you're Manchester United and you're looking at the group of players outside of Cristiano Ronaldo, there's nobody there that can really lift their hands and say, I did my job to the best of my abilities. There are a lot of players that were very underwhelming and underperformed. And as a group, they underperformed. So they have very little credibility and very little equity, if you're Manchester United currently in that locker room. If Cristiano is still there, this is what I would say to those players. You know he's going to score goals. And what do you need to win games? You need to score goals. So you might as well, might as well accept the fact that yes, he's going to throw his arms around. Yes, he's going to be mean every once in a while. Yes, he's going to say things that perhaps you take personally. But roll with it and go with it because he gives you a better chance to win games. And in the end, you're there to win games. This is what, what professional sports is all about. If you are a Manchester United, you want to gain, win games with consistency. They haven't done that. It's time for all those players in that locker room to grow up. Do you agree with that, Alessandro? Yes, of course I agree. I mean, the fact is, from my point of view, as I told, I told you before, there's many problems in that team. That uh, and, and uh, Ronaldo came in that team thinking that, you know, we're going to win again. So his mind is programmed in order to win and to win not only games but trophies on the other side i believe that different players in in man united are, are not ready to win the premier league 
are ready maybe to finish fourth at the table as a maximum result. So there is a mismatch of uh, expectation and uh, and quality also, to be honest. Let's talk about another player then that looks like he might not be coming to Manchester United. Frankie de Jong, Mark, his agent insists that he's not leaving Barcelona and he won't be taking a pay cut either. Is this now starting to look a little silly for United? Shouldn't they be looking for another player, an alternative? I think we're all getting a headache with this Frankie de Jong story, aren't we? Because this has been going on for, for weeks now, even months, and it's been the same situation all the way through. This isn't a new revelation. It's just to say, it's just the, the same message we've been told again. United and Barcelona both need this deal to happen for different reasons. United need a player, a big player. Barca need the money. So the clubs, in terms of the deal being done, that's quite an easy one to do, and they are very close to agreeing a deal. But obviously, you know, Juan Laporte is making noises that he doesn't want to sell him for a, a different audience to what he's selling Man United. But De Jong consistently throughout this has, has made it clear he doesn't want to leave. He doesn't want to leave Barcelona. But United are still pursuing this deal. And it reminds you so much of when David Moyes took over in 2013. They spent weeks and weeks and weeks wasting the time trying to get Cesc Fabregas. He didn't want to come. He just played United for a new contract at Barcelona, which he got. Now, I'm not saying that Frankie De Jong is playing for a new contract at Barcelona. I think he just wants to stay at a club where he'll play in the Champions League next season. Great place to live. Fantastic club. Barca... Their transition is always going to be a lot slower than United's because United have got six teams up against them in the Premier League. Barca have just got Real Madrid and Atletico. They'll always be in the Champions League. So De Jong is thinking, long term, stay at Barcelona because they'll get better before United get better. Now, United have to say at some point to Eric Ten Hag, who wants him, we're going to have to move on because it's not happening. He's not showing the willingness. If this deal is going to happen now, it has to be Frankie De Jong who makes it happen. And he's not showing any sign of doing that. Alessandro, if the player doesn't want to leave and he's got a contract, even knowing that maybe the club don't want him around, should he stay? Does he have every right to stay at Barcelona? Of course he has the right to stay at Barcelona if he wants and if he has a contract. The problem is if they don't want you, <laughs> you need to think about what could be your future because sometimes clubs doing weird things in order to, you know, to make you leave let's be honest and uh, on, on this situation we're talking about one of the most incredible young midfielder that we have uh, now in, uh, in europe and uh, i think everybody needs you know take a big breath uh, a step down a step back sorry and uh, and think okay what are we doing uh, and let's see together without no one around us you know barcelona and the young first and what we want to do. Because at the end of the day, is communication the most important things and sharing what you really want. And at some point, Barcelona still continue to say, you know, Frankie, I'm sorry, we need that you leave. Okay, you need to go. Can you understand Barcelona's stance on this, that they obviously know that they have Rafinha in, mm. that they can get rid of Frankie Dion, get some money in for him? Can you see why they're being how they are about this? Well, that's exactly the reason as to why Frankie de Jong and Manchester United make sense from Barcelona's perspective, because financially you would get some money back from your investment and you would put yourself in a better position to continue to address your, your own financial concerns. Now, if I'm Frankie de Jong and I love me some Barcelona, right? Okay, and I love the food and I love the people and I love the city and everything is great and I want to stay in Barcelona. All of that magic and all of those good feelings end whenever John Laporta comes up to me and says, you need to take a pay cut. At that point, I'm like, hey, 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 John, I love this place, but I don't love it that much. And, and that's a conversation that apparently has taken place where John Laporta says, we want Frankie de Jong to stay. However, we need to restructure his deal. I, if I'm Frank de Jong, I do not give a hometown discount and then I go and search for a new opportunity. Because once you start giving those spaces and those, the, the, those sort of leniences to the uh, club, then it's almost as if you give the hand and they take the whole arm. You don't want to go down that path. That's a slippery slope. That's a contract that you earn and you sign. And so did the club. It is your right to then get paid whatever amount of money you are owed. And so if they come to you and ask for a pay cut, if I'm Frankie Young, I say, see us. 
I'm out. I'll go somewhere else. Uh, speaking of slippery slopes and maybe not wanting to go down that road, I wanted to get your thoughts, Mark Ogden, on Eric Ten Hag pretty much reappointing Harry Maguire as captain. The guys here in the studio were very critical. They said he could have waited a few weeks or not actually talked about it at all right now. What did you make of it all? Well, yeah, I mean, I was in the press room when he was asked the question in Bangkok and he said straight away Maguire's the captain. And I, I was surprised in the, in the sense that you know, he doesn't have to do it now. It was it's pre season, it's it's too early, he's not even seen the team play. So he, he decided this before seeing the team play. The flip side of course is that we we then the, the, the journalists who were there between ourselves asked, Who would he give it to? Now there are a lot of candidates at Man United to actually take the captain and that is an indictment of the squad they've got because you can't give it to David De Gea because it as a goalkeeper he's not it doesn't communicate well enough with his team. That's always been one of his problems. And then beyond that, who have you got in that team? You can't give it to Ronaldo because, as we know, one, he wants to go, and secondly, he doesn't have the full support of the dressing room, despite the fact he's the best player. And, you know, back in the day of Roy Keane, Real Ferdinand, Ryan Giggs, that this wouldn't have been an issue. But beyond that, Marcus Rashford, no, because he struck with the pressure last season. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling here to think of that. Bruno Fernandes, no, he's not consistent enough. So I guess Ten Hag has done it because he's looked around the dressing room thinking, there's nobody else. And I suppose is the new manager has to say, set the authority fairly quickly. At least he's made a big decision because he looks around thinking, there's nobody else. I mean, I'd, I'd love some of the guys think, who would he give it to at Man United if it's not Harry Maguire? That actually was going to be my next question for you as well, Mike, but obviously all you journalists answered it amongst yourselves. I suppose he can always change his mind as well. Anyway, I'm not going to get your thoughts on this one. The guys said enough about it the other day. Mark has been writing over on our website. He had an exclusive interview with Jurgen Klopp. You can check that out over on ESPN.com. And you can catch these guys back for the latest edition of Extra Time. We have Del Piero, Ali Moreno and Mark Ogden answering your tweets. Barcelona have announced that they've reached an agreement to sign Rafinha from Leeds, beating Chelsea to sign the Brazilian. And the word is it hasn't had an effect on the future of Usman Dembele either. Mm. And his contract looks set to be going ahead at Barcelona too. Jules is still here, but I want to start with you, Ali Moreno, on this one. Mm -hmm. Do those two play together then, Rafinha and Dembele? How does that work? <laughs> That's a good question. It's a really good question because they're similar profile of players. Now, the financial struggles of Barcelona are well documented. In fact, there is a, a really good article by Sid Lowe on our website where he goes into detail and breaks it down. And my reaction after reading the very long article, very detailed, was, huh? There's no clarity there. I can't quite understand how is it that they're making it work, but apparently they are. Okay, so let's assume that everything is taken care of financially and Barcelona are able to make these signings. If you're going to indeed invest money, then I just don't see why you're investing money in similar players. That you are now resigning, apparently resigning Dembele, and that Rafinha now comes in. These are players that, while they're not the same, it's a similar profile, as I just mentioned. And both of them like to play on that right-hand side and cut inside to their left foot. Sometimes we see Rafinha playing on the left, but that seems to have been taken over by Ferran Torres uh, under Xavi. And th that seemed to be working pretty well for Barcelona. Ferran Torres coming off the line. And then you have on the right-hand side, Usman Dembele. I don't know that they play together. I don't know that it makes sense for them to play together. And I don't know that Barcelona is a better team with those two guys on the field at the same time. What do you think, Jules? Does it make sense to you? It's only very interesting to see how Xavi will, will play them. I think you can move them better to the left hand side and he can, I mean, he's got both feet. He's the most um, um, ambidextrous, ambidextrous, that we say, footballer yeah. Yeah. right now in the big clubs. So. I think you can move him, but certainly Ali is right. His, his favorite position is, on the, is as a right winger, which is also Rafinha's favorite position. If you add on Sufati, who at some point surely will come back to the play that way, we hope for him. The, the wonderful talent that he was before, plus Ferran Torres, plus potentially Lewandowski, and Aubameyang who's still there. That's a lot of forwards. Even if you play in 4-3-3 formation, that's a lot of players that you'd have to leave on the side to start the other three, really. So. It'd be very interesting to see how Xavi sort of manages all the egos and everybody and, and how he plays them. Of course, they, 
we always say great players can always play together, but they might need a bit of, of time to adapt to each other and to adapt to changing positions. If Rafinha plays on the left or on the right, Dembele on the left or on the right, all of that will have to be taken in consideration. I'm sorry that I know this. They say ambipedal. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes me sound like a right pedant because I just say two-footed, but ambidextrous works too. Okay. Uh, Jules, while you're here, we want to know what the latest is on Robert Lewandowski because Barcelona are said to be pushing on with trying to sign him. They are certainly, yes. They made a, another offer of around 50 million euros yesterday. I mean, there's a point where... I agree with Ali, though. I'm not, I'm not too sure. I don't really understand how financially they can do this, but good on them if they can spend all that money on Rafinha, on Lewandowski, on Dembele. Uh, we saw Kessie and Christensen being, being registered. With Lewandowski, he's pushing for a move, even if he turned up at training for his first day back, and there's no, there's no clash there. Certainly, you know, he didn't say, I'm not coming back because I want to move. But certainly, he's pushing for that move, and, and Barca is really, even if there's other clubs like PSG and Chelsea, Looking at, looking at him too, Barca is, is the team that he wants to join. Will, will Bayern stay strong and reject every offer, even if Barca up the next one, for example? That remains to be seen. But, but certainly, I think we can say that Barcelona are really trying everything they can now to get Robert Lewandowski. And it's a question of if they can convince Bayern Munich to let him go or not. Uh, you, all, you can keep up to date with all the latest Barca transfer news and the latest on Robert Lewandowski. Is he pedal? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> By uh, going over to uh, what? Yeah, our transfer talk website <laughs> over on ESPN.com. Day eight of the Women's Euros is now in the books with a look back on the return to Group C action. Here is Sebi Salazar with Emma Hayes and Steffi Jones. Thank you very much, Kay, Emma Hay, Steffi Jones with me here in studio. Great day of action in Group C. The second game gave us five goals, but let's start with the first game. Sweden against Switzerland. This one, massive implications for the Swedes. They bounce back. Very blown lead in their opener to the Dutch. 0-0 at the half. Sweden comes to life here in the second half. 53rd minute, the counterattack ends at the feet of Fridolina Rolfo. Emma? And that's what she does week in week out I mean she for me is the star player on this Swedish team certainly didn't do well enough up until this point but I think well taken goal by Rolfo and everybody expected them to run away with the game but they didn't the Swiss respond almost right away Ramona Bachmann you pointed this player out in the pregame Steffi yeah great job I mean here did Hedvig Lindahl should have taken both hands. She's not getting a grip of it. And then ah, Ramona Bachmann shows her qualities. 79th minute, Sweden from the set piece get into a dangerous spot in the area. They made some subs. Hannah Benison, one of them. Big strike right there, Emma. You know what? It was what the game needed. Changes. Get something a bit more dynamic as Canrid not making onto Rolfo and Benison. Certainly got the talent. First goal in a Swedish shirt and a much needed one. Sweden then 2-1 winners over Switzerland, picking up their first victory of Euro 2022. All right, Steffi, what do we think of that Swedish performance? Well, we were not satisfied, but we also said we might expect too much from a Swedish team. Mm. Why do you say that? Well, that it's their kind of style playing, and I would have wished them f for, for more of flexibility in the system you know like reacting to what is happening and what is needed and that kind of feels like they're not able to it flexibility means changes so what changes would you make i think the changes that were made but i've, I've said that 10 players from the 11 starting come from the olympic gold medal for i think this team has ran its course and they need the bench and they need a little bit more dynamic energy and maybe a little more flexibility tactically and maybe that will happen as this, as the tournament progresses so Sweden get the win then after drawing the Dutch in their opener. Let's check in on how Netherlands did. Second game today in Group C. They were facing off against Portugal, a team we told you, we've told you all along. <laughs> going to be fun to watch. Seventh minute. Uh, they're not going to be fun to watch defending corner kicks. Though. I mean, what's going on here? No, I mean, I said it before. They, they commit three 
front post players, and as a result of that, the Ducks do a great job of hitting the back post. And Steffi, it happened twice in the first 16 minutes. This just, this just can't happen, can it? Well, it shouldn't happen. I mean, uh, you know you have to defend better at set pieces. Um. Big moment here, 34th minute. Silva into the box. At first, no call, Steffi. Then they go to VAR. They do give a penalty. Do you agree with it? Yeah, I mean, I thought she slipped, but looking at the review, and, and it really showed she got touched, and so it's a penalty. Carol Costa stepping up and smashing home. But Portugal had a lifeline there. And then to start the second half, Costa going to turn provider here, sends it across. Diana Silva, 2-2, Emma. Oh, what a cracking start to the second half. You could see Portugal went in with all intent. Talk about cracking. Daniela van der Donk, Steph, nice. wow. Yeah, that was a, wow. Nice finish. In the corner, wow. That the difference as the Dutch hold on for a 3-2 victory over a very brave and very exciting Portuguese team. So here's what the Group C table looks like with just one game left to play. The two teams that we thought would be at the top of the table, they're right there. And right now, they are dead even. Okay, we got five goals out of the game. Exactly what we wanted, but what we convinced <laughs> by the Dutch. No, but you looked at the cap accumulation of the players that were missing and you could argue, you know, mm. they're missing a lot of quality. Uh, I think players like Van der Donk stepping up, big moment. I think difficult week for the Dutch and difficult for Mark Parsons and probably delighted to just come through that with the three points, even though it wasn't convincing. Mm. Steffi, in the pregame, we talked a lot about the absence of Vivian Miedema. Who do you think stepped up to make up for that today? Well, well, at first I thought that it was a great step from Bernstein. She, uh, she really mixed them up mm -hmm. and she really tried many things. Spitze was the one that, for me, was the link trying to stay organized. I mean, it's not easy. You're playing against Portugal, Portugal and they're unpredictable. Yeah. You know, you don't know what they're doing and you're just feeling like, ah, you know, just, yeah. and so she tried to keep the structure and she won many balls and yeah, so I would say Spitze and Bernstein were the two players. All right, so there we have it. Group C, second day in the books. The second day for Group D is coming up. That on Thursday, Italy against Iceland, 11.30 a.m. Eastern time on ESPN2. And then France against Belgium. That's the game in the afternoon. Coverage starts at 2.50 p.m. Eastern time right here on ESPN+. Plus. All right, Kay, that's it for us in the studio. Back to you. Thanks, Sebi. And then on Friday, England will be back in action after that emphatic 8-0 victory over Norway. So far, England have caught the attention. So too have Germany. So today, Alexis Nunes was at an England media day where she caught up with England goalkeeper Hannah Hampton and tried to talk to her a little bit about the potential of England and Germany meeting later down the line. Have you had a look at uh, the others in Group B and probably kind of happy you may avoid Germany? Um, we've obviously been watching games and been just admiring the tournament as it is um, with how far the women's games got but we're not really looking at who we're going to face, we're just looking at ourselves and taking it game by game. We've obviously got Northern Ireland next and that's the one that we're focusing on the most so um, whoever we have we know we'll have a, we've got a good job and a good team and, and we can do what we need to do. Alexis Nunes with us now. I mean, fair play to you, Alexis. It's what everybody's talking about right now. The fact that they both will avoid one another when it comes to the quarterfinals. But so many people think that it could be an England-Germany final. Emma Hayes has said it in the studio. What's the feeling back home in England? Yeah, okay, honestly, I was trying to get it out of them. <laughs> Even though that they couldn't say it and everyone wants to respect all the teams in the tournament, and rightfully so, I think they're definitely sighing a little sigh of relief after what we've seen from Germany so far. I mean, I, I know for our Euros coverage, we have spoken about it with Emma, and we knew the concerns um, surrounding this Germany team going into the Euros, the fact that they were a bit unpredictable. Um, you know, in the six games that they've played so far in 2022, they only managed to win two. And these are the eight-time champions we're talking about. But in the back-to-back -back games, I've seen them play at Brentford right here in West London. Kay, I think they are the team to beat in this tournament. I know the momentum is with England, but 
Germany have just looked so good. Their physicality, um, you know, the way they go on the hunt for goals, they're finishing. All they need is like a sniff of a chance. And you can almost guarantee that ball is going in the back of the net. And look, you look at what England did with Norway. But I think as Emma had said it to us that, you know, there's not, it doesn't make sense we talk about Norway because Norway were just shell-shocked and didn't really show up. Germany has been just as ruthless against the likes of Denmark and Spain. These are two top teams. And it's not even like Denmark and Spain didn't show up. They did. They took the game to Germany. And whatever they threw their way, Germany humbled them and humbled them in a big way. So I think that Germany definitely are looking like the team to beat. And England, at least England, fans will be happy to avoid them in the quarterfinals. But look, as they said, they've got Northern Ireland coming up next this would be england's easier game of the group and even though people will think it may be a a bit of a dead rubber it really actually isn't even though northern ireland are already out um one of the things chloe kelly said today at the media day when we were talking to her she was asked if they have as many goal scoring chances as they did against norway will they just continue scoring and run the go the score up and she said, absolutely. That is exactly what Serena Wigman has told them to do, to be ruthless in front of goals. So we can expect some more goals. And that will be special because a certain Ellen White, she's one goal behind Wayne Rooney's tally for becoming England's most prolific scorer of all time, man or woman. She's already the all-time leading women's goal scorer, but she's on 52. Wayne Rooney has 53, and I feel like she could not only level that record, but she could absolutely smash it in this tournament, and um, I think if she does that mentally, that would be great for England if they ever do have to face Germany later on. Oh, best of luck to Ellen White on that one then, Alexis. And we'll be hearing more from you as the tournament does roll on. Sadly, you'll probably be hearing a lot more football coming home chants. We'll be talking more Women's Euros on tomorrow's show. Make sure to join us then. Now, here we go. Shaka Hislop. Congratulations to him. He's been awarded an honorary doctorate in civil law for his excellent work with show racism, the red card. The honorary doctorate coming from Newcastle University for using his influence to combat discrimination and being instrumental in the founding of show racism, the red card. It was a lovely speech as well mm -hmm. from our Shaka, wasn't it? And if you get a chance, man, let me tell you, just hear it. Listen to it on social media. Shaka Hislop does great work. And we know him for the guy with a smile, but he's doing important work and doing a fantastic job with his organization. He really is. As Ali said, go check out his social media pages. He will be back with us on Sunday, and we can talk to him all about it. Stick around, though. Extra Time is coming up next. Hello, and welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. Alejandro Del... Uh, here we go. Oh, right. Ready, right? Are you ready? Uh -huh. We're going to go Alessandro, Alejandro. Uh -huh. Ali, Alessandro, Ali, Alessandro. Oh, Ali Moreno, you. Alessandro Del Piero, and Mark Ogden here with me, Kay Murray, to answer your questions. <laughs> okay, I got nice. through it. That was cute. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can keep it up. It's a good day today. Yeah. It's a good day today. It is National French Fry Day. Okay. So, first question Give us your favorite type of French fry normal, curly, sweet potato, waffle, crinkle cut, Belgian, steak, shoestring, etc. Also, for us Yanks, what's the difference between chips versus crisps? Uh, Alessandro Del Piero, what's your favorite type of fry? <laughs> normal. Normal. I don't want to. I don't want to have too many things on top. Normal is the best for me. I, I don't believe he actually eats them. I think his body is a temple, and uh -huh. he doesn't touch the French fries. Mm, I don't know. I think he's had a French fry here and there. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I tell you what. I do like the normal, but just to go a little outside the box, I'll do waffles. Oh. Waffle fries, and uh, if they're from Chick-fil-A, even better. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. I like some of that. A bit adventurous. So what's the difference between chips and crisps then, Mark Ogden? <laughs> well, speaking as a uh, from the UK like yourself, it's not even a debate, is it? Chips are fries and crisps are crisps, <laughs> basically. Um, so I'm always confused about chips and crisps, but for me, a chip is a, is a fry, and it's just that's just the way it is. The, there's plenty of the food stuff that we can talk about, but a chip is a fry. And the best fries are sweet potato fries. <laughs> Ale, do they serve fries in your restaurant? Yes, of course. 
All right. Mm. Now, here, here's a question. Did, did Frank go to Alessandro's restaurant or not while he was in L.A.? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't there. Oh. But, by the way, <laughs> he texted me and he, he was checking on me if I was there. So it was very nice. I don't know if you, because you want to come on my expensive on my restaurant, probably. But uh, <laughs> besides that, and I'm, 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 I'm not happy because I miss him. Uh, I would love to spend some time and talk about all the days. You know, see, see, this is when... I thought maybe he was hiding out the back. When well, which I, I, and I don't blame him. Now, here's the other thing. You know, Alessandro just said, you know, I have to reach out to Frank so we can talk. See, there's something wrong about that, Alessandro. If indeed you reach out to Frank, you're not going to talk a whole lot. He'll do the talking, <laughs> you'll have to do the listening. That's how it works. That is how it works. <laughs> All right, question for Alessandro. Do you remember a pre-season game you played against Barcelona in 2005, where you scored, by the way, when a certain Lionel Messi made his first Barca start? Your boss, Fabio Capello, even inquired about taking him on loan. Did you imagine him being so great after that? Uh, I wish that happened. Uh, I remember pretty well that time because uh, you know, in our industry already many people were talking about Lionel. Uh, so it was the first time and the only one actually that I had the opportunity to play against him. And it uh, uh, was, was funny because, you know, at the half time, it was uh, at the end of the game, sorry, he was doing so well. At the end of the game, I was speaking with my teammates on the defense and say, listen, how is this guy? And I, listen, guy, it's, it's unbelievable. I try, I try to hit him. <laughs> to take him down, but I, I couldn't do it even that, you know, so it was uh, already something beautiful to see uh, even, even in that early age. All right, next question. Mark, do you think United should give Martial, Rashford and Sancho a go as the top three this season? We know how talented these players are. Surely all they need is some playing time. Uh, well, they probably will get some time together because there isn't anybody else to play, is there? Because Cristiano wants to go, and the other options are, you know, Anthony Langer, so it's very limited. So they will get game time, but they've had plenty of game time in the past. I mean, Anthony Martial has had probably more game time than anybody else, probably six, seven years now. I think Marcus Rashford deserves a second go at it. I think he, you know, he deserves a chance to prove that the last 18 months aren't his best form. And Jaden Sancho is still bedding in. He's, he's been there a year, but yes, he will get time. But I, I do think that Anthony Martial is. He's probably, it's like one of those cats, isn't he? He's, he's probably only seventh out of his nine lives now, but he's still there. And, he, you know, he did well against Liverpool in that first game in pre-season in, in Bangkok, but we can't judge him on that. Please don't judge him on that because that was just a game in a freaky situation, crazy temperature, crazy scenes, and it's not a game you can base a player on for, for the next season and a half. I'm assuming there's a big difference between that pre-season Lionel Messi in mm -hmm. 2005 uh -huh. and some of these pre-season Manchester United players that Mark's just been talking about. Yeah. It's funny when people say all they need is playing time and all they need is repetition and okay, well how much more playing time do they require? Uh, Marcus Rashford has played plenty for Manchester United and so has Jaden Sancho, it's been a year and clearly so has Anthony Martial. And I would suggest the people that are saying, well, Jaden Sanchez, you're still getting used to Manchester United. Okay, maybe. But when you have a successful player and one that fits in, that guy is going to make a difference right away. Look at Luis Diaz at Liverpool. He didn't take any time to get used to his surroundings and playing and having an impact. And I know every player is different, but I think all these players have had plenty of time already. A uh, question for you next, Alice. Uh, Are you okay? Are you no. going to make it through this? No. <laughs> you wouldn't think I've just done a whole show of it either, would you? Uh -huh. I think I've run out of my lives. So, so what's the difficulty? Okay. So, because I want to just say Ali Moreno, uh -huh. which I should just say. Uh -huh. But then I start to think, I'll say Alejandro, and then it turns into Alessandro. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to say Ali Moreno. <laughs> okay. Do you think Barca will be competitive in La Liga Champions League next season after they complete the signings of their remaining targets, such as Lewandowski, Koundé and Aspilicueta? 
Well, uh, yeah, sure, if they complete all of the signings and all the targets and everybody shows up in the locker room and they don't take any time to get used to being the new surroundings and they played well together, then surely, yes, Barcelona will have an opportunity. But there are a lot of ifs there and we're yet to see whether Barcelona is going to be able to pull this off. I have no idea financially how they're going to do it, but assuming that they do so, yes, they will be a very good team. I'm not even going to say your name, but the next one's for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, while Barca are still working on incomings, Madrid looks so calm so that not a single transfer news other than preferable departures. Do you think that Madrid still needs at least one more signing in attack, or are they okay with what they have right now? I think they need one more player that could take the position of Karim Benzema him up if he goes down injured if you're managing his minutes somebody who is a credible goal threat or at the very least somebody who can step in and do the job for a couple games at a time not to the level of Benzema but at the very least somebody who's uh, much more so than just a warm body which is what they got from Luka Jovic they need an upgrade to that and somebody who can do the job if Benzema is not available Alessandro, do you think Barcelona and Real Madrid will be competitive in the Champions League next season? Listen, I agree in everything that Ale, Alex, Alejandro, or how you want to call <laughs> Mr. Moreno with you there. I agree completely in everything, even especially if, if definitely have to be signed some players, Barcelona, from my point of view. But I also agree with what you say about uh, about Real Madrid because you know Benzema is coming from an amazing season but we need to consider in, in everything in all these pictures that we have the World Cup in, in the middle so it would be a very weird year for for the big and top players the, everybody are looking including Benzema for the last you know the last chance to win the World Cup so that we got to put a lot of effort physical and mental you know, effort in order to achieve that uh, that goal. So the rest of the season could be interesting and it could be different than what we're supposed to have in a normal season, let's say like this. Uh, it's a question for Alessandro. Hey! Ale. Woo! Alessandro Del Piero. <laughs> yes. Del Piero. <laughs> question for you, Ale. Who was the crazy, uh, craziest teammate you ever played with during your career? Cassano, Gattuso, anyone else? <laughs> you pick already two, two big guys. I mean, uh, definitely a little bit more crazy, Cassano. Yes, because it's very unique uh, personality. And uh, and uh, Rino Gattuso was another one, but uh, Rino was also very very focused on what he had to do. Uh, on the other side, uh, Antonio. You know, I think he wished some opportunity because of his behavior, but we we had a good time together. I mean, nothing bad to say to either of them, especially with Rino that we won the World Cup. Nice. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just drop that right there. <laughs> I know, any crazy things they did during their time, during your time with them now, that you can tell us? No. Nothing that we can say in, in television. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember Cassano getting told off at Real Madrid by Capello uh -huh. and him making him do laps on his own of the pitch. And he wasn't taking it seriously. He was just waving to all the media <laughs> like it was hilarious, you know. So, yeah, crazy Cassano. Great stories about him. But as Ale said, mm. many that cannot be told on air. Uh, I'm that, sure he's had a Mark. french fry or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said that. All right, for Mark, who do you think City will miss more this season? Sterling, Jesus or Fernandinho? Oof, that's a good question. I, I, I'd imagine that people would expect to say that Sterling goes Jesus, but I, I think Fernandinho, a peak Fernandinho, they definitely miss. But I think I think they can they can live without Sterling and, and Jesus. As good as they are, I do think that you know they brought Haaland in. They, they're not going to miss Jesus' goals, and they've got so many options on the wide positions. They've got Mares, they've got Phil Foden, they've got Bernardo Silva. I mean. Kevin De Bruyne plays that wide. I, I think that they'll cope quite easily without Raheem Sterling, and I think that they'll do the same with that Jesus. I think Calvin Phillips is a good replacement for Fernandinho. I don't think they'll miss him massively, but I think of those two players, the one who'll leave the biggest hole, but it's probably going to be Fernandinho. 
I tell you, Mark was building up, right? He was saying peak Fernandinho, and then he listed the reasons as to why they wouldn't miss Jesus, why they wouldn't miss Sterling, and then they said, well, Calvin Phillips is a pretty good signing in place of Fernandinho, so yeah, they're not going to miss any of these three players. They've had a good summer. They've had a very good summer, Manchester City. <laughs> they've done, they've got, they have done some fantastic business. And if Nathan Ake goes to Chelsea as well, I mean, you're talking about they'll have made a profit on their transfer dealings, a big profit, and they'll have brought in two great players and maybe more. So I think Man City's done brilliant business this summer. All right, last question. Alessandro Del Piero. Other than Juve, at which other club did you enjoy the most? Mm. Well... Definitely, you know, I made my debut in the professional football, so with Padova, and where I spent, you know, five years in the youth, uh, and, and that's, you know, the, the approach into the real football. Uh, of course, my heart is in my little town when I start with my friends, my school friends, uh, in the, you know, in San Vendemiano. That you know is a very small country with five thousand people. Uh, that is you know everything started there, okay. Uh, uh, and then after after that, of course, for sure, Padua because you know I made I saw the first time the uh, big stadium and uh, I played with professional player. I was training with them. I made a debut and I scored my first professional goal. So that you know a good time. Thirteen till eighteen years old is a. Uh, is incredible appeal for for a for a boy. And how was Australia, Ale? Australia was great. I had an incredible experience and was uh, two years uh, very full of uh, everything. I mean, for me, uh, change uh, a lot. Uh, you know, Australia is 24 hours from Italy by flight. So in the South Hemisphere where they speak a language that I used to, till now, not speaking very well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the other side, they, they are driving on the, on, on the right side, that is opposite on what I used to do. And uh, it's winter is, uh, is in August, where I used to go to uh, make a bath in or the, or the ocean or the sea. <laughs> so it was very different, everything, uh, very opposite, not only different, opposite. So it takes a while to uh, understand uh, what's going on, but I had incredible experience because they 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 welcomed me in an amazing way. I, I was, you know, super uh, adopted by everyone in Australia. We we spent a good time with my family. Uh, and we play in all sold out stadium, and and it was a big movement, and we had a lot of oh, a lot of fun. No, it sounds like a lot of fun as well. I don't know what, what's more exciting, to think of Alessandro Del Piero running around in Australia or him at Padova. Did you see the twinkle in his eyes, the sparkle in his no. eye, talking about his time on Padova and his first professional goal? Oh, man. Little did yeah. we know that this guy would become the player he became. Huh? Alessandro Del Piero, much better than Alejandro Moreno, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I'll get that right. Well, and you got the names right, which yes. is more than I well, did thank tonight. You. So thank I, you. I've had a stinker. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for sending in your questions. Some great questions there today. Make sure to do the same tomorrow. I won't be back butchering everyone's name. You'll be happy to what, hear. Why is that? <laughs> Dad's back in the You're seat You're punishing tomorrow. yourself? He'll see you then. Is it your band? <laughs> what?